Hi, on behalf of the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, or ADPC, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you to the online self-paced portion of this training course on disaster risk management for sustainable development. Just a quick reminder, since this is an online self-paced module, you can always pause, rewind to any point of this online material to get a better understanding of the terminologies and concepts covered in the material. With that, let's get started. Module 1, Introduction to Disaster Risk Management, Key Terms and Concept. So by the end of this module, you should be able to understand the related basic concepts and terminology of disaster risk trends, climate change and disaster, early warning systems, and other terminologies. You should be able to explain the differences between disaster risk management, disaster risk reduction, and disaster resilience. In addition, we'll be looking at some of the latest trends, such as the anticipatory actions, and how that actually can fit into the overall community resilience. Now, let's take a look at this picture. This is an earthquake in a very remote area. So is this earthquake a disaster? Let's think about it. Now, if your answer is no, you are correct. An earthquake, just like other extreme weather events, are naturally occurring in all parts of the world, and we refer to them as natural hazards. There is no way for us to stop a natural hazard from happening. But when people's lives and livelihoods are destroyed, then natural hazard will become a disaster. So in the picture earlier, an earthquake in a remote area where there is no people, no houses, no infrastructure, that is not a disaster. So when we're talking about disaster, we need to talk about the risk of disaster. So we define disaster risk as the potential loss of life, injury, or destroy or damage assets which could occur to a system, society, or community in a specific period of a time determined probabilistically as a function of hazard, exposure, vulnerability, and capacity. As you can see from this diagram, the intersection of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability was your disaster risk. So when we talk about disaster risk, it is often demonstrated in a function of hazard, exposure, vulnerabilities, and capacity. Now let's look into each of them in detail. Now let's look at hazard. A hazard is a process, phenomena, or human activity that may cause loss of life, injury, or other health impacts, property damage, socioeconomic disruption, or environmental degradation. When we look at a hazard, there are actually three different types of hazard. Natural hazards, these are naturally formed phenomena just like a storm or typhoon, or anthropogenic, which makes it a man-made, or a social natural, which is a combination of natural and anthropogenic hazards. Of course, when we talk about the different type of hazards, you have the hydrometeorological hazard, such as typhoon, hurricanes, cyclones, floods, etc. Then you have the biological hazards, the, such as bacteria, viruses, or parasites. Then you have the environmental hazard, such as the soil degradation, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, etc. And you have the geological or geophysical, such as earthquake, volcanic activity, and landslides, rock slides. And you have the technological, which is basically industrial pollutions, nuclear radiations, or toxic waste. After hazard is exposure. Exposure actually means people, property, systems, or other elements present in hazard zones that are thereby subject to potential losses. And vulnerabilities, basically, is the conditions that determine by physical, social, economic, and environmental factors or processes 
which increase the susceptibility of individual or community assets or systems to the impacts of hazards. And the last component of the disaster risk function is capacity. A capacity is a combination of all the strengths, attributes, and resources available within an organization, community, or society to manage and reduce disaster risk and strengthen resilience. As you can see from the disaster risk function, capacity is a denominator. So capacity is sometimes described as the opposite of vulnerability. But this kind of definition overlooks the fact that even poor and vulnerable people have capacities. Indeed, the starting point for capacity development is the existing knowledge, strength, attributes, and resources individual organizations or society already has. So there are actually four types of vulnerability and capacity, social, economic, physical, and environment. Social vulnerability and capacity. Social vulnerability refers to the potential negative effects on community caused by external stresses, on human health, disruptions in the availability of services, or damage to the built environment. These stresses may be a result of disasters or human-reduced change. Some population may be more susceptible to harm due to factors such as age, income, education level, and other socioeconomic factors. A great example of social vulnerability is access to healthcare between low income and high income communities. A great example of social capacity is education. If people are educated and is more aware of disaster risks and the potential impact, they will be better prepared. Economic vulnerabilities and capacity. Economic vulnerability in the context of disasters refer to the susceptibility of economy, be it at the individual, community, or national level, to suffer damage and loss in the face of a disaster. This vulnerability is primarily determined by economic resilience or its capacity to absorb shocks and recover from them. Example of this is a coastal community that relies heavily on tourism and when there is a storm or typhoon, that will certainly have a greater impact to them. For economic capacity, we can look at insurance as a great example of such capacity or government sponsored funding or responses to disaster is another great example of economic capacity. Physical vulnerabilities and capacity. Physical vulnerability to disaster pertains to the potential for physical damage to buildings, infrastructure, and natural environments due to an event. This can depend on the several factors, including the intensity of the hazard, the design and the structure of buildings and infrastructure, and the effectiveness of existing mitigation measures. So a great example of the physical vulnerability is building in a seismic zone. When the earthquake strikes, these buildings will be damaged by the earthquake. Another great example of physical capacity is if these buildings in the seismic zone are retrofitted so they can actually withstand an earthquake better. The last type of vulnerability is the environment vulnerability and capacity. Environmental vulnerability refers to the susceptibility of a natural environment to damage and degradation as a result of natural or man-made disasters. They can significantly disrupt ecosystems, leading to loss of biodiversity, soil erosion, water, and air pollution. A good example of this is when we have a soil degradation in a coastal zone. And a great example of the environmental capacity is looking at planting mangroves that can actually protect the coastal area from erosions. Now we understand how the different components of a disaster risk works. Let's look at the formula one more time. So in order to reduce the disaster risk, we have to somehow increase the capacity at the same time, decrease the vulnerability exposure 
as we cannot change natural hazards, we cannot prevent natural hazard from occurring. So when we talk about disaster risk reduction, we are actually talking about the reductions of exposure to disaster. We are talking about the reduction of vulnerability to disasters. At the same time, we're talking about increased capacity to manage and to cope a disaster. Now we know what is a disaster risk. Let's look at the disaster risk management. Now this is a famous diagram that actually illustrates the different phases in the disaster risk management cycle. Before we get into that, let's look at that, what is disaster risk management. Disaster risk management is the application of disaster risk reduction policies and strategies to prevent new disaster risk, reduce existing disaster risk, and manage residue risk, contributing to the strengthening of resilience and reduction of disaster losses. So from the diagram that you can see, there are four different phases in the disaster risk management cycle. You have the prevention mitigation and preparedness. These are the activities that you can do before a disaster strike. Then you have the response, recovery and reconstruction phases. These are the activities that you do immediately or right after a disaster event. So when we look at the pre-disaster phases, these include mitigation or prevention and preparedness. As you can see, we usually don't like to use the word prevention because that can actually give you a false hope that you can actually prevent a natural hazard from happening. So that's why we usually focus a bit more on mitigations rather than looking at prevention. So when we look at mitigation, that can be actually be divided into two different types of measures, structure and non-structure, to minimize the risk of disasters on a long-term basis. When we talk about preparedness, these are the activities and measures taken in advance for an effective response to the impact of disasters. As I mentioned earlier, there were two different types of mitigation measure. You have the structural and non-structural. So for structural mitigation measure, we usually talk about dams, we talk about the flood levees, we talk about the ocean wave barriers, earthquake resistant constructions, and of course, with disability in mind, accessible evacuation shelters and route that are able to be used by persons with disabilities. Now, when we talk about non-structural mitigation measure, these can refer to institutions, legislation, systems, or strategy to mitigate the impact of disasters. This can also mean land use planning and their enforcement, research and risk assessments, understanding the potential impact, and information and public awareness, and most importantly, culture of safety. When we're talking about preparedness, if you look from this picture, that person is able to put out the fire with a modern equipment, or it means that they have the training and the necessary equipments for them to actually be prepared for a fire. So when we're talking about preparedness, we usually refer to the various different activities that is related to food, shelter, and health. And the preparedness can be applied not only to our lives, but it can also apply to our livelihood that also include livestock and agricultural products. It can also talk about security. It's very important to also mention gender issues and social inclusions, looking at the most vulnerable groups within our society, how we can actually help them to be better prepared for disaster. And there are some activities that is exclusive for certain type of hazards. For example, flood preparedness. You need to have shelter in place. You need to have a risk map. You need to have early warning systems in place to warn the incoming flood. And you need to have an understanding of the vulnerable groups, such as the elderly, the young, the disabled, how to help them evacuate during a flood event. Same applies for earthquake. 
landslide and fire. They are very unique activities and preparedness measures that specifically address to those hazards. Now let's look at the post-disaster phase and this includes response, recovery, and risk construction. Response means the action is taken directly before, during, or in immediately aftermath of a disaster. This could be dispatching a search and rescue team uh, to stop piling of relief supplies before, right before disaster strikes, and looking at how the community research and res uh, response team can help the local communities in the first 24 to 48 hours of a disaster. On the recovery and reconstruction, this means the process of maintaining or reestablishing vital infrastructure and systems following a disasters or human-induced disasters. These are usually long-term and requires a large amount of resources for you to rebuild, reconstruct the society after a disaster. So the cost for recovery is more expensive and painful than the cost for preparedness. So that's why it is always very important to be better prepared than to pay for the response and the recovery after a disaster strike. So earlier we mentioned the disaster risk management. It actually used the word disaster risk reduction or DRR. So what is disaster risk reduction? Disaster risk reduction is aimed at preventing new and reducing existing disaster risk and managing residue risk, all of which contribute to the strengthening resilience and therefore to the achievement of sustainable development. So simply put, the disaster risk reduction is looking at policies and strategies, is looking at plans and programs, is looking at community-based disaster risk reduction, and is looking at public-private partnership to prevent and to reduce disaster risk. So going back to the formula earlier, when you have an increased capacity, that also means a reduced vulnerability, and you will have a reduced disaster risk, and that will actually lead you to have less damage and less losses. And this is probably the word that you have heard a lot recently, it's called resilience. So resilient is the ability of a system, community, or society exposed to hazard to resist, to absorb, to accommodate, to adapt to, to transform, and recover from the effects of a hazards in a timely and efficient manner. This including through the preservation and restoration of its essential basic structures and functions through risk management. So now you understand the definition of a disaster risk management, disaster risk reduction, and disaster resilience. So why do we need to focus a bit more on the activities and the measures that you can do before a disaster strike? Because cost. Now based on a research done by the United Nations, every $1 invested in the prevention could save $7 in recovery. And that is a very good return of your investment. So what is the relationship between disaster risk management and sustainable development? Actually, they are linked very closely. Disasters add often devastating costs to societies and communities in terms of financial losses, destroy infrastructure, and loss of lives. They can set development back for years. At the same time, environment destructions and lack of sustainable development increase disaster risk and impact. So it is critical, as you can see from the diagrams, that they actually work together in terms of disaster risk management and sustainable uh, development.
Now we're understanding the difference between disaster risk management, disaster risk reduction, disaster resilience. Let's look at the bigger picture. Uh, from over 30 years before, the focus is really has been on response. But now everybody is talking about disaster risk reduction and preparedness. So there is definitely a shift in thinking over the years. So let's look at them in details. So there is a definitely a shift of thinking from response to prevention. Traditional disaster risk management focused primarily on response, reacting to a disaster once it has occurred. Today, there is an increased emphasis on prevention and mitigation and identifying potential risk, planning for them, and taking steps to reduce them. There's also a shift from silo to an integrated approach. Disaster risk management was once seen as a standalone issue addressed separately from other aspects of social and economic planning. Today, it is really recognized as a cross-cutting issue that should be integrated or mainstream into all aspects of planning and development. There's a shift from top-down to a bottom-down approach. Early years, when we're looking at disaster risk management, it is often rely on the top-down approach where decisions were made by the central authorities. Now there's a shift towards a more participatory bottom-up approach that involves local communities in the decision-making process and recognizing the unique knowledge and insights. And there's also a shift from a single hazard to a multi-hazard approach. There is a recognition that communities often face multiple interconnected risk, and this has led to the development of multi-hazard approach that assess and manage this risk in a more holistic manner. There's also a shift from the short-term to a long-term thinking. Disaster risk management has moved away from the short-term temporary solutions to focus on the long-term sustainable strategies for risk reduction and community resilience. And there's a shift from physical to socio-ecological systems. There's an increased recognition that the disaster are not just about physical hazards, but are deeply intertwined with social, economic, and ecological systems. The shift is reflected in the concept of socio-ecological resilience, which emphasizes the interconnectedness of human and nature systems. Last but not least, there's a shift from risk to resilience. While risk remains an important focus, there has been a shift towards building resilience. This involves strengthening the capacity of communities to withstand and recover from disasters and to adapt and transform in response to changing conditions. Now let's move on to the other very important topic that is shaping our world today, climate change. Climate change and environmental degradation are some of the greatest challenges facing humanity. Beyond direct environmental impacts, climate change has a serious development economic and humanitarian implications. Climate change is altering the face of disaster risk. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, it leads to changes in the frequency, intensity, duration, and timing of extreme weather and climate events. It also causes increasing sea level and temperature rises. But climate change is also increasing societal vulnerabilities for example, from stresses on water availability, agricultural and ecosystems. The IPCC predicts that climate change is likely to slow economic growth, erode food security, and exacerbate poverty in most developing countries. For more than a decade, development and humanitarian practitioners have been advocating for an approach that integrates disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation to build resilience in a sustainable way. Disasters and climate change both have similar consequences for people's lives. There is significant overlap between the problems that disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptations seek to address. Disaster risk reduction covers non-climate related disasters such as earthquake, but it also addresses climate related disasters such as flood, drought, cyclones, and storm surge. With climate change predicted to increase the frequency and or intensity of climate related hazards and effects, populations already exposed to those hazards and effects will be at greater risk. Population exposed to hazards may also experience stresses due to long-term changes in climate. 
For example, changes in seasonality, unpredictable rainfall, and sea level rise can affect livelihoods and health, making people more vulnerable to all types of shocks, events, and further changes. So when we're talking about climate change, climate events, we have to talk about early warning systems. So what is early warning system? It is an integrated system of hazard monitoring, forecasting, and prediction, disaster risk assessments, communication, and preparedness activity systems and processes that enables individuals, communities, governments, business, and others to take timely action to reduce disaster risk in advance of hazardous event. And I'm sure that you probably have heard the end-to-end -end and people-centered early warning systems. The difference between end-to-end -end or people-centered early warning systems and regular early warning systems is that there are actually four new dimensions to the end-to-end -end and people-centered early warning system. There is the dimension on disaster risk knowledge that is based on the systematic collection of data and disaster risk assessment. There is a new dimension on detection, monitoring, analysis, and forecasting of the hazards and possible consequences. And there's a third dimension of disseminations and communication by an official source of authoritative, timely, accurate, and actionable warnings and associated information on the livelihood and impact. And there's a, a dimension of preparedness at all levels to respond to the warning received. And the latest terminology is on anticipatory action. So what is anticipatory action? Anticipatory action refers to actions taken to reduce the impact of a forecast hazard before it occurs or before its most acute impacts are felt. The actions are carried out in anticipation of a hazard's predicted impacts and based on a forecast of when, where, and how the event will unfold. And anticipatory actions allows for more effective delivery. The FAO has calculated that every dollar they invest in anticipatory action could give families $7 in benefits and avoided losses. We'll have a detailed sessions on the anticipatory actions and its applications within the arena of community, community resilience uh, during the face-to-face -face portion of this course. Now, if you look at the diagram, this is actually taken from the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asia Nations, a regional framework on anticipatory action. It really shows you how and where these actions or the anticipated actions can take place before a disaster strike and the potential benefits that it can bring in terms of the reductions of the impact or the traditional responses that you will need without these anticipatory action. So again, we will have a very detailed session to go over anticipatory actions on the first day of the face-to-face -face sessions of this course. And this takes us to the end of module two. Again, since this is a self-paced module, you have the ability to rewind, to go back to a certain point of the presentation, to listen to a certain terminologies or concept to get a better understanding. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attentions and a goodbye.